Welcome to Close Listening. I'm Zach Morgenstern, joined as always by silent co-host Ludwig von B. And today I am reacting to an album called The Doors by the band The Doors. So The Doors, of course, an absolutely iconic rock and roll band. I think I first really heard about The Doors when I was in my eighth grade music class. It was a cool experience uh, at my middle school. We got to learn guitar. Uh, I was quite into it. I ended up teaching myself before I took the guitar course, but there was this one kid in our class who was more into it than me, uh, whereas I learned, you know, enough chords to accompany myself on any song I wanted to sing. He, you know, self-taught himself to be a great lead guitarist. This kid, his name was Miles. I remember him saying that he wanted to be buried in the same cemetery as Jim Morrison of The Doors. So I figured, oh, Jim Morrison must be another one of these great guitarists. Well, it turns out Jim Morrison is the lead singer. Uh, as for why Miles did not want to be buried in the cemetery with the guitarist from The Doors, I have to assume it's because Robbie Krieger is still alive. But yeah, it just so happened that I never got around to listening to Doors music. A few years ago, I was at the library and I finally found a Doors Greatest Hits album, but it was hopelessly scratched, so I didn't get any sense of the music. So for years, I've pretty much only known The Doors' most famous song, Like My Fire. So this was my first chance listening to really more than just that song. A final thing I should mention, I earlier in this year, I had a, a Linda McCartney photography anthology yeah, from the library. And Jim Morrison was amongst the many rock stars photographed in there. And in a little caption taken from the writings of Linda McCartney, she talked about how she thought Jim Morrison was really a shy guy and a real poet. So I was intrigued by this idea that someone who was at the center of so much great music saw Jim Morrison not just as an iconic rock star, but as a poet. So let's talk about the tracks on this record. Uh, it starts with a famous one called Break On Through. This is high energy rock. And the lyrics, they're quite cynical. You know, they talk about the futility of trying to find escape. You know, the day destroys the night, night defies the day. You know, wherever you run, you'll always end up back where you came from. There's also a weird line in the middle where he goes, everybody loves my baby, she gets high. So it's hard to tell if he's saying anything poetic there, you know, whether implying everybody loves my baby is something he likes or it makes him insecure. It's just so vague. The next song is called Soul Kitchen. This is supposedly about a literal restaurant where Jim Morrison would insist on staying in the after hours. This song has a slightly more easy feel to it than uh, Break On Through. And because of Ray Manzarek's organ, it's kind of sounds like the classic instrumental piece Green Onions by Booker T and the MGs. But beyond that, it seems to continue the kind of drunken stupor from the previous track. We do get a tonal change with track three, Crystal Ship, where uh, the music outright tries to be beautiful. We don't have the rock and roll aggression. At the same time, it feels very thematically similar to Break On Through. It's another Another song that's trying to be a love song, but is so drowned out in ex existential dread that it doesn't quite sound like a love song. So my one issue with this song is I don't feel like the organ is a good fit on it. You know, I know from doing my own home recording and trying to add organ sounds to songs, it can be great, but it's just such a loud in your face instrument. You have to use it in a toned down way. So I wish that uh, Ray Manzarek, the Doors keyboard player had just stuck to playing piano on Crystal Ship rather than playing the organ. Track number four is called 20th Century Fox. I wonder if this is a pun on the film studio. It feels like a bluesy version of the jazz standard, The Lady is a Tramp. At the same time, it also continues the sort of angsty and psychedelic feel we've gotten so far. So it refers to this woman who's the 20th Century Fox having the world locked up inside a plastic box. So perhaps this is a pill bottle, perhaps it's a drug reference. Or perhaps it's just a reference to plastic being the way of the future, as was implied in the famous 1967 film, The Graduate, and The Doors album also comes out in 1967. Track number five is a cover. It's called Alabama Song, brackets, Whiskey Bar. This is a song, I don't quite understand the history of it. It was apparently published in an anthology put out by the German communist playwright, Bertolt Brecht, but he didn't write it. The music is by the famous composer Kurt Weill. The lyrics are by Elizabeth Hauptmann. As for the Doors recording itself, this is the first track we hear experimenting with instruments other than the ones that the Doors tend to play themselves. So it brings in a zither-like instrument called a marxophone, which creates a kind of carnival feel. 
I guess it's kind of a coincidence that you had a Marx phone on a song associated with a Marxist artist, uh, Bertolt Brecht. Anyway, I believe Bertolt Brecht's original intent when uh, he commissioned or published this piece was simply to be a reverend. The anthology he originally had it published in was a satire on the works of Martin Luther, uh, and then he used it in one of his plays as a musical number performed by a group of prostitutes. So I feel like the song just has a general irreverence to it, and in covering it, the doors are both playing to their own 1960s irreverence while also showing that they have appreciation for a broader artistic tradition. They're not just into the chaos of the moment. Then track six takes us to the most famous song. And I think it was the strongest song on this record. It's called Light My Fire. So this one is supposedly a real band collaboration. The guitarist Robbie Krieger came up with the core of what the song is. Then Jim Morrison wrote the lyrics to the second verse. And then Ray Manzarek, supposedly really influenced by Bach when he came up with the organ part. Lyrically, this song continues the theme of a kind of dazed and confused love, wanting something more, but being too cynical to really believe that is possible. There's an interesting contrast in the chorus itself. Light My Fire sounds like such a pumped up lyric, yet it's sung in a kind of depressing tone as if I want you to light my fire, but I don't really believe you can do it. And the chorus itself is weirdly a melodic. So I remember when I first heard my Light My Fire, I both liked it and found it kind of underwhelming. And I have to imagine that's kind of the point because it's trying to combine this fiery and this depressed mood. And in the process, create a holistic representation of the 60s and the drug-based counterculture aesthetic. Track number seven is another cover. It's called Backdoor Man. The song was written by the famous Willie Dixon and recorded by the famous Howling Wolf. Backdoor Man I, refers to the idea of a man who would have affairs and then leave out the back door. Here I found the organ did add texture to the song, so it was a good choice to include Ray Manzarek's organ on it as it made it sound a bit different than cl classic blues, which to me can very quickly all sound the same. And this song also felt like another chance for the Doors to revisit that rough, rowdy energy of Break On Through. Track number eight is called I Looked At You. This song is yet another example of a sort of love coming from a weary mind song. My one critique of it is maybe there's a too, there's a bit too much organ. And this song, you know, unlike the more cynical ones, it feels like an outright embrace of um, druggy ex escapism. You know, despite the fact that it's in this kind of foggy mood, it sounds overall optimistic. Track number nine is called End of the Night. This was the B-side to break on through. Uh, and it feels like a sequel to that song, though I believe it is an older song. And while the A side of that single, Break On Through, talked about how it's futile to run because the night and, night and day always come back to each other, this song imagines a sort of psychedelic alternative world where rather than the night just becoming a day, there's this mysterious other place called the end of the night. Track number 10 is called Take It As It Comes. This one again brings the album into a bit more of an upbeat place. It feels like perhaps the one piece of sober advice on the record, though still sung in plain language so that the person in this drug feud state can process the information. Musically, it reminds me kind of of Rock Lobster by the B-52s. And then we get to one of the standout or boring songs on the record, uh, depending on how you look at it, the closer fittingly called The End. Musically, this song has an Indian sound. Uh, Robbie Krieger had apparently learned from Ravi Shankar how to tune his guitar in a way that makes it sound like a sitar. And like the Ravi Shankar-influenced George Harrison song, Within You, Without You, this song keeps in the same sort of slow to medium-paced musical place. Uh, it doesn't have a punchy verse or chorus. So lyrically, it's supposedly based on Jim Morrison's reflections on the story of Oedipus, uh, you know, the king who unknowingly marries his mother and Jim Morrison saw this story as being like a warning about getting back in touch with reality I mean just look at the Wikipedia entry it feels like one of these stone things where Jim Morrison was convinced he's talking about something but no one else could really understand it and like a lot of the songs we've heard on the record it sounds like it's about a surreal attempt at escape what differentiates it comes near the beginning of the song. He says, of our elaborate plans, the end. I'll never look into your eyes again. So throughout the record, we've heard these drug-addled escapist songs, but they've tended to be love songs, whereas this song just sort of ends the album on a mellow note because he's like, 
hey, baby, I'm in this dazed and confused state, and I don't think you can stay here with me anymore. I'm going to stumble my way out of this alone. So what was my experience with the doors? It's certainly a historical artifact and, you know, songs like Light My Fire and uh, Break On Through can certainly get stuck in your head. At the same time, I think this is one of the few albums I've heard that has a psychedelic feel absolutely throughout, and it ends up becoming a bit too much for me. I think the one other album I listened to in the past year that was kind of like that was that was so overwhelmed with psychedelic elements was the Rolling Stones, Their Satanic Majesty's Request. Uh, and that one is widely viewed as a bad record. I didn't like it so much. And the funny thing is this is viewed as one of the greatest records of all time. And it's certainly objectively better, but the difference is smaller than one might think. If one doesn't like too much psychedelic texture, this record is certainly going to overwhelm you. I, and I think perhaps one of the interesting dynamics that's going on here is the Doors seem to be, at least in this point in their career, a true band. So all of their sound comes contained with, from within the talents of the individual players. Thus, Jim Morrison's lyrical tendencies dominate the sound of the record, as does the fact that Ray Manzarek was very into playing the organ. And so on lots of songs where I don't think organ is a great sound, organ still ends up being one of the instruments. And it's interesting because through the years, disproportionately, I've listened to solo artists as opposed to bands. And one could argue that that distinction isn't really real, that solo artists have backing bands, they just don't end up on the front of the label. But with groups like The Doors, as well as The Zombies, who I listened to pre pretty recently, I'm getting the sense that no, the band versus solo artist distinction does matter. Because at least with some of these classic bands, you know, and with the exception of the second half of the Beatles career, it really feels like they try to write songs where they play all the instruments. You know, it's not like a Neil Diamond record where, you know, he writes a song on his guitar and then they get an orchestra to make the song sound rich. No, the Doors wrote songs that the Doors could play. And sometimes that worked out well. And sometimes that made things sound a bit repetitive. So that was my mixed experience listening to The Doors. Obviously, there's a lot of talent here. If you're a Doors fan, let me know what you think of this record. Let me know what you think of their other records. They apparently made quite a lot, despite the fact that Jim Morrison died so young. So certainly interested in digging into more Doors albums in the future. I'm Zach Morgenstern. This is Ludwig von B. See you next time. Mm -hmm.